James. Oh yeah, hold on a sec, we'll do the intro. Welcome to our podcast. <laughs> I'm James. I'm Barry. And this is the Living Myth uh, podcast where we take Irish myths and our dreams and we unravel them in attempt to improve our state of life and our understanding of the divine and the mundane. Mm, well worded, well worded, James. Mm. This is the lovely dog, McCool. Yes. Named after a mythical legend and all. Uh, very so relevant, very you're relevant. In for a treat today. We're actually going to be doing a story about Finn McCool. And it's the salmon and knowledge, isn't it? Yes. So we were, uh, we were reading it today and we were having to think over about it. Mm. And we wrote down some bullet points that we're going to talk through the story. About. So do you want to actually just read through the story as part of the... Read the story? Yeah. Okay, cool. For the folks at home, you know. Yeah, it's for the folks at home. McCool, into bed. Good boy. Lay down. As a good boy. It's lucky the poet didn't say that to McCool. <laughs> <laughs> that is it, chopped off. I know when you read it. Hmm, <laughs> where are we? Right. I, uh, coming of Finn. Now, so I'll start from here. And he went on to learn poetry from Finngus. Or Finnegus. How would you pronounce that, James? Finnegus, I think. Finnegus, yeah. yeah. So he went on to learn poetry from Finnegus, a poet that was living at the Boyne. For the poets thought it was always on the brink of water, poetry was revealed to them. And he did not give his own name, but he took the name of Dimna. Seven years now, Finnegus had stopped at the Boyne, watching the salmon. For it was in the prophecy that he would eat the salmon of knowledge that would come there, and that he would have all the knowledge after. And, at, and when the last salmon... <laughs> and at last and when at last <laughs> Jesus fucking sake <laughs> and when at last the salmon of knowledge came he brought it to where Finn was and bade him to roast it but he bade him not to eat any of it and when Finn brought him the salmon after a while he said did you eat any of it all at all boy I did not said Finn but I burned my thumb putting it down and the blister that rose in the skin and after doing that I put my thumb in my mouth what is your name boy said Finnegus Dimna said he it is not, but it is Finnear's your name. And it is you, and not to myself, the salmon was given in the prophecy. With that, he gave Finn the whole of the salmon. And from that time, Finn had the knowledge that came from the nuts of the nine hazels of wisdom that grow beside the well that is below the sea. And besides the wisdom he got then, there was a second wisdom that came to him after another time. Oh yeah, that's it. that goes on to a different story then. Mm-hmm. So That's kind of a story yeah. of the salmon and knowledge then, yeah. yeah. So yeah, how do you want to unpack that? Look how much I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hot. It's so hot. <laughs> it's so hot. Like, my face is dripping. Yeah. And then reading in front of cameras and shit. It's just like, yeah. Yeah. you know? Okay, so uh, yeah, how do you want to... So, I suppose we'll start at the start. So, I thought a lovely line was, for the poets thought it was always in the brink of water that poetry was revealed oh, to them. I actually wrote that down I wrote well. that down as well, yeah. Because... Yeah, well, one thing that I actually read about was I was telling you about the, the Philly, which is, so it's not just a poet. These were visionary poets. Mm. So they weren't, like, before, apparently in, like, really historical times, there was, the Philly absorbed the roles of the Druids, the poets, and so there were lawmakers, they were religious. The Brehens. The Brehens. So they had all that in the Philly. And the Philly were so highly esteemed that even up to like Elizabethan times, so we're talking what, like 17th century, 16th, 17th yeah. century, the, the, the English were kind of like weirded out because the head poet would eat from the same bowl <laughs> as the, he had the same, he had the same status as the High King, the head poet. And they're, because oh, I was reading different versions of the myth and it's, there's, it's not just poetry that they teach them. They were teaching them magic spells. Yeah. And, mm. and prophecy. And like uh, mm. soothsaying and clairvoyance. So it's not just a poet. It's like a, almost a more shamanistic role. Which I thought was really interesting to think that that's who he's going to for an education. Yeah, that is interesting. Because then you, you think that going to the waters. Like that's where their poetry came to inspire them. Mm. Because they, they really distinguished apparently between normal poetry and visionary poetry isn't it funny that the effect that language has 
like you know like the, the Eskimos have many words for snow mm. and us we just have snow maybe ice and yeah. sleet we probably have hail you know we have like three or four or five or whatever yeah. but they have so many and it allows uh, compartmentalization to happen in your mind of of the different ways things can take form mm. and like those poets like we just think of poems as poems but when yeah. you make the distinction when you when you go there and make the distinction all of a sudden you're like oh yeah these are these are two different things it's like the first person that must have differentiated uh, a grey wolf from a timber wolf or something you know yeah, yeah. and being like oh there's actually a difference here from a from a person from an untrained eye yeah know? actually yeah that is a because yeah just like well, you were saying that uh, you were talking about this with your dad and your uncle right I found that quite interesting and your debate about what is his name again fin finnegus is it finnegus yeah yeah like were you not saying he's a poet and mm. your dad was saying he's a druid or something like that was it my da- yeah my dad said uh, he was a king and yeah. my uncle said no he was a wizard yeah so and i thought so, that yeah. was interesting because actually that tends to encapsulate the uh, fuller role of the of the of the philly because that's that thing. is weird, yeah, actually, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, the the chances, yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought that was quite interesting. That is interesting. Because in in like I did read another version where he wasn't he was a he was a druid or something that he mm. wasn't a poet. Mm. So obviously, maybe people who came along later translated it differently or something, um, or just over time, maybe different versions strayed in different ways depending mm. on the Philly breaking down into different traditions or something. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the story is because I didn't go into the I've never heard of them before. It's really interesting. I must look them up now. Yeah, the Philly Act. I remember. Philly Act. Yeah, because Philly, Philly kind of sounds French, doesn't it? Would you like a Philly fish? Yeah, hey, a Philly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You're a Philly. Yeah, yeah. It's a horse, isn't it? It's like a young horse or something. Uh, yeah. A Philly, yeah. yeah. Or it's like a yearling female horse or when she's in her first heat or something like that. Yeah, so I thought that was... In- like, and... Yeah, just... Straight off the bat, that thing of their association with water mm. is interesting because the water it flows, it flows. There's depth, but in also the water. it's symbolic of the unconscious. That yeah. is the, and yeah, you were saying during the week, but like we we're talking about, but how? Why is it the symbol of the unconscious? Mm. And I was kind of doing more reading in Jung and stuff because, yeah, I didn't feel like satisfied with the answer that I'd given you. I was like, ah, that's all right, like, but it's. Why? And mm, maybe you might say for the listeners, what was the answer you gave me? Yeah, so I think what I had at that point was that, like, well, water is. So in the dreams and in, in psychoanalysis, it tends to symbolize more the emotional realm or the realm of the unconscious. Mm-hmm. And when I was thinking out loud about that, I was thinking, well, they're more lunar, so they're more capricious and emotional and forces of nature rather than the consciousness, which is more steady so the ocean ebbs and flows it's mm. got high tides it's got low tides it's got that predictable unpredictableness and it's something other it's the other mm. realm and that's what i think is very interesting is that like it's the other realm from which we emerged like yeah but that's maybe an evolutionary projection that people wouldn't have traditionally known yeah but you have evolutionary memories that aren't like normal memories either as well you know yeah if you're so th- it's, talking about how deep it goes yeah yeah, yeah i mean we did come out of the water there at some point, according to as far as we know. Yeah. And uh, it's it still part of our mythology. If yeah. you just think that mm. science is a mythology in itself, our mythology still says that we emerged from the water. Yeah. Which, if you connect that with the original Egyptian creation myth, there's this island Pate, like at the start of creation, mm. and that's the island, like protruding from the waters. That's the beginning of creation. Because that, wow. and the psychoanalyst yeah. like Neumann says that that's, that's the first day of creation. That is the consciousness emerging from the unconscious. Because for much more of our, our history, and yeah. probably more of our lives than we give ourselves credit for, we're unconscious beings, and we have been unconscious, working purely on instinct. Yeah. And it's only in the last, what, maybe 70,000 years with the cognitive revolution that we've been, that, that little bit of consciousness has been protruding more and obviously now it's grown to like massive extent it's like mm. dominant yeah so well you, yeah well you it's, could make a good argument for that that's true. <laughs> but uh there's definitely probably an ebb and tide to that as well you know it's like even when you uh i'm getting to some pretty anecdotal stuff but even when you think about like the mayan calendar this big long cycle of like you know people having like great wisdom and then kind of almost forgetting the wisdom and going mm. into this like this much larger night and day mm. you know like the like a summer and winter 
to a night and day is like this to the summer and winter. It's the same yeah. super long cycle, you know, of, of this expansion of consciousness and the contraction of consciousness, you know. Which is another thing, and you could connect that up. That's not just Mayan, that's like the Indians with the, mm-hmm. the Wheel of Samsara, so the Wheel of Time, like... But they were all Indians, really, aren't they? They would have a similar type of culture and stuff. From would they? Mayans and... Well, I mean, like, they're all in the Americas. They were much closer to each other than anyone else. Oh, I'm else. talking about the... I'm not Columbus. I'm talking about the Indian Indians, oh. not the American. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, the okay. real Indians. Yeah, the real Indians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Columbus I showed, about the Indian Columbus Indian showed up in America and been like, so this is India. <laughs> What's India? You're Indians then. <laughs> 500 years later, we're like, yeah, the Indians. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, but yeah, so like different culture, different parts of the world and completely separate evolution. And they mm. came up with that idea of the, the circular wheel of life and... What is an era in, in, in samsara? I don't know, it's thousands and thousands of years. Mm. Like, there's a smaller cycles and the bigger cycles. So, yeah, similar thing of, like, the wheels of time. But why was that? Why well, it's just some of the stuff that you'd hear about, um, just from reading about different cultures around the world and stuff. Uh, you'd really imagine that there is a, a source to it all, because a lot of it's so similar. There's definitely like a source to people's thinking. So the generation of ideas and the generation of culture is coming from the same source. Mm. And so you're going to ha- have similar things because human beings are very similar, you know, yeah, cross culturally yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, um, yeah, I don't know what I was going to say there. We'll let it, let it. <laughs> so no, I think, I think no, no, that was just coming to, you were talking about the ebb and flow. Yeah. So I guess just to come back to the theme of like the unconscious and why it's water, yeah, I guess I, I can't give it like, I still can't give like a perfect answer to that. Just mm. that it's... Well, when you were talking about your dream the last day, actually, I had a really interesting po- uh, thought about, you know, it's coming out of the water. Like you took it back out of the water with you. You know, that's mm. your sword now. Like that's your, that's your tool. But a, a sword is something that can't be made underwater. You know, mm. a sword is something that's like someone left that there, you know. Mm. And like in the story when Arthur after he passes the sword on and tells that knight to throw that back into the lake mm. and he throws it in and a hand comes up and catches it. The lady it's of the lake back. reclaims yeah, the it. the lady of the lake reclaims it. And so there's a couple of things there. One of the things is the the uh, similarity to the Finn McCool thing of that he's still awake or that he's still alive somewhere and it's waiting for the time in the future when yeah, he's so you called upon again. Yeah, part of the myth. So if you didn't see last week's episode, <laughs> um, the part of the myth is that McCool, Finn McCool never died, not the dog, the, the myth, Finn McCool never died and he's asleep somewhere in a cave and he, he is waiting for the call of the door Fian when Ireland needs his, him, him and his crowd again and uh, yeah, so that's still alive, that, mm. that passion, that intensity, that ferocity is still alive, it carries on into the modern Irish spirit and you know even even more modern rebellions even named themselves after the Fianna mm. you know when you go back to the whatever over 100 years ago those people that lived then were like associated themselves so much with that with that mystical ancient passionate Ireland that that's what they used to fuel themselves to to, yeah, to try and yeah. to try and overcome what must have appeared to be at the time an unconquerable foe like the British mm-hmm. Empire were like all over the whole world they were like such a military yeah, I mean, might Yeats wrote the poem September 1913 uh, kind of saying that the, the dream of Ireland was dead mm. and then he wrote yeah, how is it ancient Ireland is dead and gone it's with yeah. O'Leary in the grave yeah. yeah and then he comes back three years later and he's like yeah I was wrong <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, just he, he even like there's a guy he doesn't like and he's like you know I don't like him, but I respect him for being a part of this and for mm. bringing that vision of Ireland. And mm. it is that thing, because that was a revolution. Like the 1916 Rising, which is the birth of the Irish state. Well, mm. the birth of the, yeah, the birth of the Irish state just a few years earlier. Mm. But that, that act wasn't carried out by soldiers. It wasn't a coup. It was poets. It was mm. teachers. It was, it was educated men mm. being fueled by that energy from thousands yeah. of years before. Yeah. Which is really, uh, I don't know, I, I find that quite a, that quite a beautiful cool, yeah. thing. Like, they get yeah. all riled up. It's like watching Braveheart or something when I yeah. start reading about all this stuff. Yeah. So back to the, back to the myth. Mm. The 
Or actually, was there something we were meant to say there about the dream? So we were just talking about... The dream. Yeah, we were just talking about water. You were kind of saying the, yeah. the sword coming out of the, the water wasn't made in the water, but it was reclaimed by the Lady of the Lake. Yeah, so it's like it's like you got that. So it's like the Lady of the Lake left it there for you, mm. you know? It's like the Lady... It's like, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you... you and, I suppose carrying on the legacy of those who have gone before you into into maybe delving into these things mm. um yeah which is the thing like uh so and the, the young... torch sorry the torch as well remember you said it shone with the light of well no that was excalibur but yeah this, this oh, was, so, it was yeah. a flaming sword but excalibur yeah. shone with the light of 20 torches or something yeah a torch like you know i mean that shows you where to go as well like even like frodo's uh, sword glowed actually you know? an interesting point. and it was like a light it was a, a torch shines the way it's a beacon as well it's a it's yeah and for Arthur to have it for that to be given to Arthur and he's the one leading the way he's the one destined oh, he's to the torch king. bearer so yeah he's the one you know yeah he's the he's the torch bearer carrying that into the future and leading yeah. the people as a whole towards a new future mm. um, and and it's still alive that that sword is still in that lake for English people you know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a similar myth about Arthur, actually, where he's not dead. And oh, is there? Yeah? A, yeah, I think there's a similar thing about his return. Yeah. If mm. David was here, we could get him to look it up, but it's just yeah. the two of us. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, um, I think just that sense, I guess, the, the fundamental thing with the unconscious is that it's other. It's a different realm. The water is another realm from mm. consciousness. And that's unconsciousness not as a subconsciousness not as something that's inferior to us but as something that's more of a, a primal ancient thing something that moves in mysterious ways yeah. that we're constantly connected to because we are water we live by water we need water so it's that constant relationship so it tends to show up like ubiquitously in dreams where people are dealing with emotions where people are yeah like people who are grieving and and those they have dreams of water like mm. I knew one person sweeping water out of the house after a loss. And there was that dream of like, mm. just that thing of emotionality building up and you having to sweep it out and you having to, to clean yourself, almost clean your mind to, to come to grips with it. So it seems to have that thing of recurring thing of like emotions and the unconscious. So like the idea is, and it's, it's, it's the matrix out of which we came. The, the mother, it's the great mother out of which we were born, like that Egyptian myth, consciousness is born out of the unconscious, uh, mm. in like a Cartesian way of looking at things. Mm. We think like with Descartes, that consciousness is this divine thing that just is completely separate, but really it's born out of unconsciousness mm. because for much longer we've been unconscious. And so that... Deep mind, yeah. Yeah, so consciousness is, unconsciousness is the great mother out of which the heroic child is born. So it's just this, it's, it's an island on a float on, a, on an ocean of unconsciousness rather than something equal or superior to it. Well, it leads, like, that's another point that I found interesting about this and mm. it's the salmon. Okay, so the salmon, right, is the salmon knowledge. Mm. You can compare that to the tree knowledge. We might think about that in a second. Actually, so the, but the salmon comes from under the, is from a sea and it goes up the rivers. It comes inland, you know. Yeah. The salmon comes from out deep in the ocean yeah. and then it makes its way onto the surface kind of you know it goes into oh, very yeah. shallow streams to hatch its eggs and yeah. to, and then and then that's that those little smolts they're called they live in the streams then for a year before they go back to sea as well and they you know get a bit bigger and mm. get a bit able the salmon in this story got its wisdom imbued into it or got it, it became the salmon of knowledge because it ate from the nine Hazels of wisdom, next to the well under the sea. And I thought, yeah, the well. Like I thought that wording mm. was very interesting. The well is it? Is it the well under the sea? Though I'll tell you now. I think that's exactly how I read it, it as well when I read the Lady Gregory version. Uh, yeah, because I thought that. I think I think I did read it that way. It's either beside, beside the sea or under the sea. Because if it's under the sea, I mean, you got to think about that. Like, the well that is mm. under the sea. That makes no rational sense, really. Yeah. Finn, after that, after he ate it, Finn had the knowledge that came from the nuts of the nine hazels of wisdom that grow beside the well that is below the sea. Yeah, what does that mean? The, the well, well that, that is, is below, below the, the sea. sea. Well, like, the, la the lake next to us here yeah. is one of the deepest lakes in Ireland, yeah. right? 
and it's one of the deepest lakes in Ireland because it's fell by it's fed by a well. Yeah. Right. So I suppose you know maybe in uh, is in certain in certain parts or whatever like that. Yeah. There could be underwater wells. You know, like because there is underwater wells, definitely. There's you mean wells. you mean under sea level? Yeah, under this under the water like wells, like under the sea, in the sea, in lakes, on land. There's wells everywhere, you know. Yeah. But it's welling up, it's welling up from underneath, even into the ocean. And what this brings to mind for me is that, is that, even the unconsciousness, is a la- has another layer down. You know. It kind of yeah. I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah it's it's it's, it's like yeah. ooh, you know, you think you you think you're in the depths, and all of a sudden yeah. there's like an opening, and it goes even deeper. It's just yeah. it's it's this uh, giant. You're on a giant turtle on top of a giant turtle from top of a giant turtle. all the way just, down. You know, yeah, 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 it's yeah. all the way down. And like you know, cutting through that shit. You know, yeah. It's uh, the nine thinking? hazels. What I another thing I found interesting yeah. is that hazels, hazelnuts, and salmon are both considered brain foods. Like now with omega three fatty acids, so isn't that considered? A, yeah, bra- nuts are considered yeah. uh, like a brain food as well. You know, nuts like eggs, fish, things like that. Yeah. Especially salmon. Especially salmon. And, oh, definitely. Yeah, massively salmon. Yeah. And the hazels that grow under. Yeah. But to come back to that point there, what you're saying with the levels, like in Jungian psychology, you've got the consciousness. Mm. Then you've got like the personal unconscious. So these are the dreams that will have like the people you see day to day. And it, yeah. it's kind of, it tends to be about your own life and it's, it's, it's in that pattern. And then there's the collective unconscious. Mm. So that's like the level that's deeper. And that's the level where your dreams become like mythic level. They're stories. Mm. And this is where the Jungian analysts kind of, this is where, where Jungian analysts are supposed to exist. It's the dream within the dream. It's the inception, isn't it? What do you mean? Like, okay, so down there is a well. So for things that live there, mm. like we don't live there. We don't live, but there's, there's things that live there, you know? There's things is there, like, like... What you mean live there? Like entities, beings mm. that live in the unconscious, mm. yeah? Like parts of yourself are fragmented. Mm. And, you know, when you consider yourself as a whole, you consider, I'm Barry Flanagan, you know, I'm a, I'm a complete human being. I like to think of myself like that. Mm. I am a unified creature. But, you know, as you find out when you start exploring yourself a bit, you know, you're made up of many parts. Yeah. And those parts live independently within you. Mm. And the things that live inside in you might have a consciousness of their own. Yes. Like each cell has its own mitochondria, yes. you know. And I am vast. Yeah, I yeah, you're, yeah, you're the, cos- you're the <laughs> cosmos, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's the cosmos, it's cool. Yeah. Um, and so the entities that live below there, they're feeding themselves like we feed ourselves. Well, what do you mean by entities there? The parts of yourself that live in your unconscious, or possibly the collective unconscious, like old parts, old yeah, creatures. What that makes me think of is, you know, when you hear of someone becoming like a mother and... Like, I know I was chatting to someone and she said when she became a mother, something just switched inside of her. And it was like something different unlocked and she was a different person. Not like entirely her personality, but her approach to life, her Mm. sense of herself changed Mm. when she became a mother. And that's how much more primal, how much more buried in the collective unconscious can you get because you couldn't tap into that energy day to day yeah. unless you become a mother unless mm. something switches in you that you go boom yeah. you know what I mean and you go oh yeah. like because that's like, you think of the collective unconscious as the the things the parts of the psyche that are collective to humanity and that go back generations and that like nothing is going to be more collective than the sense of parenthood. Mm. That's an ancient energy because that's the very thing that causes it to be passed on. Yeah. So there's certain roles that people take on. And when you think of the collective unconscious versus the personal unconscious, like personal unconscious as the forces of your current culture. So if your culture tends you towards, um, like even just like desk work or even towards like, you know what I mean? You can be, you find your niche within that society, mm. but there's, there's a more fundamental level. So rather than the levels of your culture, which can change from, say, Persia, 500 BC, to like Ireland in 2020, 
you know, mm. you're, you're very different culture, but there's a fundamental bedrock of what it is to be human. Yeah. And those are the energies that live in the collective unconscious. And that would be the kind of, like when I think of an entity, yeah. like that energy awakening, like a mother energy, or what else would be that fundamental? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the child energy is, is the most natural archetypal energy to arise. That's a really good point. And that's a, that's a great example of an entity that can live there, you know, mm. waiting to be awoken. You know, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's in a, a dormancy. And there's lots of things that are in dormancy. There's lots of things that aren't in dormancy too. There's lots of things that are alive and well down there. And the sea mm. monsters down there. And yeah. So I think even the sea monsters are dormant though. Like, so I was, I was chatting to you about those dreams that I have where the dragon is in stone. Mm. And that's a form of stasis. You know what I mean? It's mm. like the... In the Lord of the Rings, or in the, the Middle Earth world, where the trolls, if they're out at daylight, then they're because they have to be out at night, and then if they if they get caught in the day, they turn to stone, and that's you know that's got myth mythological antecedents, so they turn to stone, and that's the thing is that like, it's ossified, yeah, it's 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 something that's not yet awoken, or it's something that's ancient that's fallen asleep. So I think that even ancient things can still like those energies like I'm, I'm not experiencing a dragon but the dragon is a is a is a primal deep collective unconscious experience mm. but i think that that can awake i think that that can be sleeping as well mm. the sea monster can always be you know well there are, there are sea monsters you know and like i mean you look at horrible people like uh, ted bundy for instance mm. like that's a sea monster you know what I mean? That's a that's something that came up within him because you know, like for example, not to digress for too long now, but um, Ted Bundy was uh, had a nice childhood. You know, like he had like oh, a, he? yeah, he was like he had an okay life. It wasn't like he was uh, grew up and had this really awful time of it and was mm-hmm. bitter at the world. No, he just I think it was just yeah, because like from even his childhood friends were like Jesus Christ, he was all right. Like you know, his parents <laughs> liked him. You know, he was like a fun kid. You know, he was like running around playing with all the others. Like there's no difference. And then at some point, yeah, he's just like maybe a sea monster came up within him and he didn't make it conscious. And so it was a it was a Sounds monster like of identified with. Yeah, it was the mon- It was a monster of the deep or something. Yeah, but, yeah. but getting back to the story now is oh, actually, I I thought of something there that in yeah. one of the versions of the myth, um, the salmon. Hmm. The way it becomes the salmon of knowledge is that it's not a particular salmon. It's the salmon that jumps up through the well around which the nine hazels are growing. And the hazel falls and the salmon catches that hazel he j- outside of the water and you catch that salmon before he falls back into the water. And that's why... Uh, fin- what's the- I keep forgetting the poet. Finnegus. Finnegus. That's why Finnegus has been spent seven years by this well. Because to catch that salmon. Mm. so I thought that was a really interesting version of the myth because it's yeah. that thing of the the worlds like the salmon has come all the way from the ocean and it's it's the actually I didn't even I didn't even like really break it down really but you think of the salmon coming from the deeps mm. like that sea monster and it's yeah. come up to the level of like the river of the stream yeah. very close to consciousness and that's where you catch it but it's a very it actually comes above the water. It comes into consciousness, and you need to catch it. It's a slippery fish. You got to catch it before it slips really back good. into unconsciousness. That's really good. Yeah. And then the salmon as well is trying to, he's trying to eat from the conscious world. He's like the hazel. Let's say in this, in this mm. part, in this particular story, this version, the hazel tree is above the water. Yeah. And so it's of the conscious world. And actually, I saw it's a thing. the fruit of consciousness. Because it's it's it has an ancient association. The hazel has an ancient association with wisdom, apparently, in Celtic tradition as well. Yeah. So it's the wisdom of consciousness. It's feeding it's, the unconsciousness. Yeah, it's, it's where it's where consciousness and unconsciousness meet. Is where you get the knowledge. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And you think of the hazel is like the tradition of the filly, of these ancient poets teaching from master to apprentice, master to apprentice. Yeah. And in Finn McCool, you get the, you get that salmon. You know what I mean? Like he's the thing, rise Because within him, there's all these, he's like the chosen one mm. in, in many senses. He's got like the, the deeds he does when he's young and yeah. his, his, his background kind of predestines him for this kind of thing. So that energy is the thing swimming from the ocean. Finn McCool is in a sense that salmon coming up and feeds from that wisdom of the filioque, that conscious wisdom that's passed down from generation to generation. Mm. And that's the slippery fish that you got to catch. 
And yeah, yeah. I, I thought that's that where was... he was sent to the poet to get a good education. I suppose yeah, a fellow like Finn McCool, from from when he was born, he was in danger of his life yeah, being taken. Yeah, yeah. And so a person like that, I mean, if you're if you're waiting for the axe to drop, you might as well go for gold. You know, because you got nothing to lose. You could be dead any day. These the band of serious warriors. They don't play around. You know, they were they were hard guys, and they if they had it out for you, you know, you can be pretty sure that like your time was limited. And so he was just like you know, I might not even consciously, but I suppose yeah, the idea was that's where heroes are born. They're born under necessity, aren't they? Yeah, because you think you know? immediately like who his father is, and the fact that his father died before his time, just like that. Mm. that sense of the orphan as well because his mother has to leave him because she would mm. endanger him if she stayed near him so you have that sense of the orphan child which is another like archetypal theme yeah is because you think like luke skywalker yeah orphan but then later on there's the sense of who are his parents really and they did that with the new star wars as well but it's, it's that's a theme is that you, the, the the hidden parents the parents who aren't present of the hero but they have a noble parentage and he's mm. connected to Cool, who's what, like, of the two of the dogs, isn't he? Yeah, I suppose that's the thing as well. If you don't know your parents, then you create a fantasy around them in your mind. They become myth, mm. myths to you. Yeah, actually, And so, yeah. all of a sudden, you're the child of a myth. Yeah. So what do you want to become? What do you expect your future to be? Is just as mythical as you, you thought your parents were. It's at least something to try to live up to, something to work towards, you know? Yes, because you don't have the personal unconscious figures of mother and father. Like that's a good example is that your parents they're fueled by that mother and father archetype but they are just persons and so Mm. in your mind you're shaped by that but if you if you're missing that layer Mm. then what like there's still a pattern that Mm. father mother archetype can still be there and i imagine much more often than that it ends badly rather than ending heroically and you could say that like the hero as an actual person is probably someone with an ego inflation someone that's been tapped into too much archetypal thing and doesn't have grounding that's just a off the cuff kind of thought but yeah. I think uh, maybe it's true sometimes definitely yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely or maybe it's reason. always partly true yeah. you know and I do think that a proper hero is one that knows that too you know like they use it you know like they've tamed fire mm. you know and so like yeah I can burn shit but I'll try my best not to get burned you know but you have to get burned to know not to get burned as well mm. uh, so it could be one of those Things that you have to go through. But like, on the subject of the burning. On the subject of the burning. Yes. Right. So, Finn McCool is cooking the fish for Finnegus, who goes off to have a bat in the, in the thing, and he says, don't touch any of it. He burns his thumb. And to soothe his pain, to ease his pain, he puts his thumb in his mouth. And he goes then, and when Finnegus is there, he brings him the fish after it's all cooked, and he's it all laid out from there, and he puts it down in front of him. And Finnegus sees in his eyes something different. You ate a bit, did you? And Finn is just like, no, 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 I didn't know, but I, uh, I burnt my tongue and I put it in my mouth. And he says, eat the fish, kid. <laughs> eat the fish, kid. I have no more to teach you. you know? <laughs> and so that wise man, he asked him to leave then after as well. You know, he was saying like, oh, I need to, you need to skedaddle out of here. I have yeah. no more to offer you. And I suppose, yeah, you know, you destroy your master. It's like a bittersweet thing because it's like that was always the goal, you know, to... to glean everything that you can from this person mm. to uh to to get what you want and that's what he did but all of a sudden you know this old man all has purposelessness mm. you know it's it's almost like the death of that man is put into the the strength of the youth of finn as well you know and even yeah. finn in the prophecy was always supposed to be finn like a tall fair-haired man you know and then as uh finn mccool after he was thinking that you know and the lion started to tug on the rod, you know? And so it was always for Finn. Finn thought it was Finnegus. Yeah. And so when he said, my name is Demna, he says, what's your real name, boy? You know, even the asking for the name. Oh, that's what's what your true you're name? Finn, right? yeah, yeah, you're Finn, aren't you? Yeah. No, it's Finn as your name is. I actually yeah. saw in one version of the myth. So I read a couple of versions and the first version, he got his name. So he was raised by this priestess and this other woman. Yeah, in, yeah it was a uh, warrior and... Uh, Kind of a bad woman, I think. Yeah. yeah, so he was raised by them. And he said, like, in, in one version, it was like, he got his name because he was in a swimming competition with these lads just after he left those. And then, because of his fair hair, they called mm. him Finn. Mm. But then in, in one of the versions, he only got the name Finn after this. Oh, yeah? Which is, 
So before, up to then, like, because Demna mm. is apparently the ancient Irish, like the language before Gaelge for Finn. So Finn was was a Gael. Yeah. Yeah, he was like the sons of the Gael. Yeah. Right? So he would have been Celtic. He would have been from like the last migration, the sons of Meal that came over from northern Iberia. Mm. Um, and he would have been speaking Irish. It was the two of the Donan that might have predated the Celts. Yeah. And so... I wouldn't. I don't know. I haven't heard that before. Actually, it's interesting that you say it, but I didn't yeah. hear about that. That previous. No, but I, I think it's just. But if you think of it as that, well, even to set aside the Demna thing, but because that was just a, a thing I tried to explore, but it was all these old books and I couldn't find the books. Mm. But the idea of naming mm. is yeah. very important. If that's when he got his name, because yeah. you think Adam and Eve giving names to things, the word like the first line of the the Gospel of John. In the beginning, there was the word, and the word was with God. And even at the start of the Tao Te Ching, naming is the origin of all particular things. Yeah, so it's like mm. naming is a very, and the psychoanalysts would say that that's when something comes into consciousness. Like even there's all when these we were things. talking earlier on about the, at the Phillies, you know, and they had a distinction between yeah, we were talking higher about poetry the and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that the idea of his getting his name then is mm. a very interesting idea that that is when he became Finn McCool. Well, he was always McCool, but that's when he became Finn. That's when he got. That's when his name was like enshrined in stone. Yeah, yeah. I suppose maybe he had the name, but he didn't. He wasn't the name, and then it was like he had to. It was there. It was waiting. It was mm. dormant, and then he became it. it Which is an interesting out of the. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what I love about looking at these different myths, these different versions, where. Yeah. Like. There's the fundamental facts are the same, but it's the inflections that kind of they're worth exploring. And actually, mm. oh, because I was thinking about this, because they were talking about there's three things that you learn from the Philly, the three spells. And in one of the versions, for him to use that power of clairvoyance or whatever, the power of all knowing, mm. he has to recite this verse, which is one of the three things you learn from the Philly. He has to put his finger in his mouth and he has to say this verse. Mm. And the second one is literally just putting the finger in the mouth like it's a form of incantation mm. that is to do with clairvoyance so it, was, it wasn't just Finn McCool like this was apparently something to do with the filia now I couldn't explore that fully but it was just something interesting but I, I was thinking mm. this right putting his finger in his mouth that's something that kids do mm. and you your yeah. people say it's a substitute for you know a nipple yeah, yeah. so it's like Again, that's the mother thing. You're tapping into oh the great God, mother. Yeah, you're tapping yeah. into the boundless knowledge of the unconscious because you're going wow. beyond consciousness. You're getting nourished by it too. And that's what the salmon is. It's nourishment from, from the underworld. It's nourishment from the great water world. Because people say intuitions. The word intuitions would be associated with the unconscious. Like people getting messages from dreams or just a feeling in your gut, which isn't a consciousness. It's not like something you put together with logic. Mm. And that is... Putting your finger in your mouth is just such that primal thing. I thought that was a really interesting. That point. is a really interesting point. Yeah. yeah, he's getting nourished by the great mother. And sure, even in your dream the other night, when the one we talked about last, mm. um, you uh, you were talking about this figurative mother. You know, yeah, the, like mother the mother who gave me the jeep. Yeah, gave you the jeep that you went to the lake with, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like, there you go. It's just this is the way. That that's where it is. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the same. This tyrannical, masculine figure then as the policeman. Mm -hmm. telling you go in there that's where that's what you want you know all this shit it's kind of like it's like you, the, the, they're at play you know the entities are at play they're alive and well in the dream world Cause, they? yeah because I think as well like that's a that's a tension within us all that you know people say you gotta follow your follow your heart follow mm. follow those gut intuitions but then your reason can be telling you something else mm. and that's the the masculine consciousness it coming into conflict with the feminine intuition the the watery underworld because you can't grasp it the thing about an intuition is it doesn't explain itself in x y and z in syllogisms it doesn't yeah. give itself a logical thing it's like listen to this trust this mm. things will work out and the logic the rational the police part of the mind wants to go that's not the rules though that's not show me where that's written now mm. show me the word show me where that has been named yeah. but it hasn't been named yet and so that's the thing it's coming from the unconscious so that's the, the tension that's always going on. Mm. Do you want to follow the policeman or do you want... But the policeman in my dream sent me into the water. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah there you go as well I mean that's the that's the thing it's just like you'll get pointed either way yeah. you know it's just like listen to what's going on because you know, yeah. like even your enemies will tell you shit about you yeah, half I mean, of the shit that they tell you might be fake and just meant to hurt you the other half might be useful shit that you well, better fucking open more, your ears for it's yeah. more honest than yeah. you know what I mean yeah because I can send you into the cold water but mm. that cold water can be where you find your sword yeah, it can be where you fucking drown as well yeah that's the thing mm. yeah chaos or order you know the new mm. order like the hero the same thing that makes heroes makes villains mm. you have a saying about that isn't it Descartes Great yeah. virtue and great vice, or something like that. Isn't it? Yeah, those that are capable of great virtue, the greatest virtue, are also are also virtue. capable of the greatest vice. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing is like yeah. in that place. When you go beyond the realm of the father, when you go beyond the realm of order and and law, mm. you go off into the wild, and in the wild, you can become a villain, because you got you do what you got to do to survive. Or else you can rise to the level of the hero because mm. you're met with the challenges that make a hero. Mm. So Finn McCool, if you had a comfortable upbringing, would he have been Finn McCool? If Brian Baru's father wasn't wasn't killed, or well, his mother and the whole fort wasn't burned to the ground, would he have gone into being the 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 king that he became? You know what I mean? Like Formed, that janitor. You know? Yeah, the janitor yeah. general. So yeah. from the last one, that yeah. The, the, yeah. the guy who becomes the greatest general ever but only remained a janitor because he never got the opportunity to become uh, mm. the, the greatest general circumstances never yeah, played I was there. actually only talking um, about this yesterday with David talking about where potential meets discipline and mm. I feel like maybe like physically you know David was saying he feels maybe he's like past his prime now you know and I'm like oh, oh, yeah. you're like 28 like you know yeah. you're, kind of, you're not past your prime you're in your prime now you know what I mean for the next few years you're going to be in your prime but your prime isn't necessarily your physical prime. Your prime is where your physical prime meets your mental discipline. Mm. Because that's when you can, that's when it's actualized, mm. you know? And so that's what you should consider your real potential. And I think that would be a helpful thing to do in people's lives as well. Because if you realize what you can actually do, you're more likely to take action. Because you're like, ooh, this is the chance that I have, you know. Mm. I better get disciplined, otherwise it's just going to slip through my fingers, like a sand, you know. And uh, like an hourglass, it's just mm. slipping through. Yeah. It's passing and, um, yeah. I think because we've talked about this before, that your energy is probably highest as a teenager. But your prefrontal cortex isn't developed enough. So mm. the wildness of the Red Knight's energies, like mm. you've got these energies just... Mm. flowing through you because they're just waking up yeah. and because they don't have the like differentiation of, of later on they're kind of just like wild horses mm. but then yeah it's that thing of those energies begin to die down so that your will them. can begin to control yeah exactly mm. you begin to have the strength and the, the knowledge to actually gain control of them so yeah, yeah I, think, I think the prime is that that sweet spot where mm. you gain control of yourself yeah but yeah. then there's also the collective energies that you're not tapping into and potentially yeah. you're energetic like you could you could unleash more energy from the unconscious mm. depending on what what fate deals you but where are we in the story where are we in the story <laughs> oh and another another thought yeah. his thumb oh yeah that's a very common thing yeah. so in so he 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 sees a boil appear on the salmon and he goes to push it down for man why can I not remember his name Finglas Finglas yeah. Finn E gas. Because he's gas. He's Isn't he gas? Isn't he gas? He's, he's gas. Finn. He's gas. <laughs> <laughs> I won't forget Finnegas. So yeah, he goes to press it down for Finnegas, so he doesn't want the you know, Finnegas. Finnegas. He's trying to <laughs> He's trying to make this salmon as good as possible for yeah. You know, it's it's not like a thing of oh I want to taste it at it's it's like I'm trying to make this I don't I don't want it to lose. Yeah. But he does that, it burns his finger and he instinctually, instinctually mm. puts it in his mouth. That's another thing is that it's an instinctual move. But then it's the, the fact that he injures his thumb. And that is in, there's actually a very similar Welsh myth that I came across when researching this as well, that there was this, and his name means fair as well, but it's in Welsh, it's mm. not, it's, it's a different word, but it, it, his name means fair. But his, he had to stir this cauldron for a witch for one year. And mm. so he stirred it and she was trying to get a similar thing of like, of, of, this, of this boundless knowledge. Mm. And after the year he was stirring it and three drops of inspiration 
jumped out of the cauldron and burned his thumb and he put it in his mouth and it was sort of a very similar myth and that mm. was him tapping into that knowledge he then had access to the knowledge which the witch was trying to get but it's it's got another parallel in the story of Iron John which is uh, Grimm's brother myth and they they find this basically they find a wild man at the bottom of a lake they bucket it out mm. also the connection with water which might be interesting to explore mm. but they bring this wild her suit man and they put him in a cage in the middle of the castle mm. and the the young boy helps the the wild man to escape because his toy goes into the cage and the wild man is like you have to release me but when he's opening the cage he injures his finger maybe it's his thumb as well and so he gets a cut there and then mm. the wild man takes him into the forest with him mm. and gets the little boy to guard over this enchanted pool of water mm. and instinctually the little boy puts his finger into the water and it turns to gold and I think that that's an interesting connection because in the same sense they like the gold is the symbolic thing but mm. we see a tangible form of that turning <clears throat> to gold because for Finn McCool it turns to gold in his mouth he has access to this boundless knowledge that's the divine wound he has all the wisdom of the nine or the, the nine, nine hazels, hazels yeah. under the, at the well under the sea which or if you want to go by your story which is a hazel is something that grows in the earth yeah. and that's like we said it's the two meetings but it's also like this fire there too it's this fire it's came from the water it's it catches fed, him in it's, the air it's, yeah. it's fed by the earth and it catches him in the air and also you know you need you need the uh, yeah, you need the air to to have the fire as well I don't know yeah it's like the it's the coming together of everything you know yeah mm. and it's the yeah so I'd connect that that theme of the divine wound taps into what we're talking about with that wilderness forming the hero yeah. because the the Leonard Cohen song I think it's an anthem it's a ring the bells that still can ring forget your perfect offering there is a crack a crack in everything that's how the light gets in but it's a roomy line as well which is I'm guessing where Leonard Cohen got his inspiration, which is the wound is the place where the light enters you. Do you have that written down here? The crack that lets the light in. <laughs> How weird is that? Yeah. But Roo- the Roo- crack Roo- that lets the fucking light in. Roo- Ruby's version is it's the wound that lets the light in. Mm. And that's the same thing as what we're talking yeah. about here. It's the divine wound. Yeah. And that's the place where his inspiration enters. What are the chances of that? Yeah. What are the fucking chances <laughs> of that? Good, actually, that is yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Great that's, lines. Too, yeah, right? and it's like, and it's as well, uh, I'd, uh, you know, I was thinking... I think I had to remind myself here. Um, hmm. He got all the wisdom of the world with all that, but also from soothing his own pain. You know, he had a he had a pain, he had a hurt. You know, and it was like ah, and he and he looked after it himself. You know. Mm. and it's the pain that he was trying to soothe is where he's getting all the wisdom from as well it's like that deep well of pain you know because like pain can well up inside you as well pain can pain can well up inside yeah you. yeah tears well up yeah. you know they're yeah. uh, it's water again you know it's like ah. Oh. and when he when he soothed himself he learned how to how to nurse his own wounds mm. and that's when he got all of the knowledge of the world because for me I think that a lot of the knowledge of the world comes from how learning how to how to heal yourself, how to look after yourself, how to maintain yourself as a proper ah, individual. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the fact that it was unintentional as well, it's just like he kind of stumbled upon it. He stumbled upon all the knowledge of the world by trying to ease his own pain, you know? Mm, that's, that's good, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, because there's something, something there to unpack. So he gets... The knowledge it wells up in him because he goes to self soothe he goes to tend that wound i guess it's yeah it's that thing of the divine wound that thing of looking after yourself mm. the having to tend to your own wounds because really suffering is so personal yeah his mother he had a lack of a mother mm. and so like you're saying when he's doing that it's like in place of a nipple yeah. you know it's just like he became his own parent oh. he's nursed himself yeah. you know yeah. in that way at that point he did anyway yeah. well because he's got that connection now with the great mother because that salmon is the connection to the ocean 
Mm. You know what I mean? It's coming up through the well, which is the, I guess, the very refined part of it. Mm. Like that's that's us consciously tapping into. Actually, the idea of a well is a very interesting image. Yeah. Like, cause that's consciously digging down into the unconscious. Where where do we have that in our lives? Like, I guess motherhood is that that we know it's a place where we know how to access those deep energies. Ah, mm. uh, well, yeah, just the thought that the the well is very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Is there much? And you more? always think of it as fresh water from a well too. Yeah. The sea is salty, you know. Yeah. And so. What's the difference between salty and fresh water? The fresh it come, rises to the top as well, you know. I mean, the salty is uh, denser. Oh, That's why you float easier in the sea, you know, because the salty water is more dense. And so the fresh water, yeah, I know I was thinking there, could there be like a lake under the water of fresh water below the saline? But it would be the other way around because it's heavier. Would it be? It would probably just dilute. <laughs> <laughs> it's in reality, yeah. yeah. So do you have any, any other... No, it's there. So let's go through the story again. So, so I, don't, I just might have some stuff. I'll just check here now. Uh, oh yeah, the well below the sea. And I thought that it was cool as well that the sea is representative of, you know, you see. Mm. You know, it comes from the sea. And it's a form of sight. Yeah, yeah it's a form of sight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the foresight. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is interesting that the sea is called the sea when it's like, you know, it's the unconscious, it's the unconscious. But then to see is the conscious. Hmm. Yeah, so we, is there any part of the myth we haven't covered? So, there was one little bit after that I was reading as well, and it was saying, um, and besides the wisdom he got then, there was a second wisdom came to him another time. And this is the way it happened. There was a well of the moon belonging to Beg, son of Buon of the two of the Danan, and whoever would drink out of it would get wisdom, and after a second drink he would get the gift of foretelling. And the three daughters of Beg, son of Boon, had charge of the well, and they would not part with a vessel of a vessel of it for anything less than red gold. And one day Finn chanced to be hunting in the rushes near the well, and the three women ran out to hinder him from coming to it, and one of them that had a vessel of water in her hand threw it at him to stop him. And a share of the water went into his mouth, and from that day out, he had all the knowledge that the water of that well could give. And he learned the three ways of poetry, and this is the poem he made to show he had got his learning well. Oh, and that's the poem and, from the May, yeah. And that's the poem. Ah, okay. What you, what you reckon's going on there? Well, the one thing that jumps out at me is that idea of red gold. Mm. Because... It's worth red gold. It's worth, yeah, it's worth, that's the thing that they'd mm. accept. But you think the implication, like red gold, well, red obviously has the connection with blood, but also in the alchemical work, the, there's four stages, but three main stages, which is the negredo, which is the blackening. So you turn the primary materia black first, then you whiten it. So there's the albedo, and that's the whitening of the rock. And then there's the rubedo, which is the reddening which is the turning it into the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life. Mm. So that's the red gold. You know what I mean? There's an mm. alchemical thing there. And I guess it's connected, like thinking about red gold as well, the connection with blood, that's like the connection with your most vital force. You know what I mean? If you really tap into your blood force. So that's just something that comes to mind there with that. But again, a well, again, wisdom. Yeah. He catches it in passing. And again, it's an instinctual move on her it's part. It's an accident. It's like it stumbled upon him. Yeah. It was yeah. like she just threw it at him and it happened to go into his mouth. Yeah. You know? Because that's her, that's her trying to like ward him away. And yeah. Yeah, I found that. The unconscious, he was almost uh, unintentionally assaulted by the unconscious. You know? And even the two of the Dunnan, they were from the underworld. They were people of the underworld. Oh, really? I suppose at that time maybe they weren't. But... They were then eventually, you know, mm. like they went in, they were of, they were the, they're the fae, they're the, the she, you know. Are the two the not the she? Apparently so. I did not know. Oh, no? No, that's yeah. bad. Well, they turned into the she, Yeah. you know, maybe that was just a way for them to integrate as well, you know, you yeah. wouldn't know because a lot of them did, like in the stories in this book, they say that um, there's a, there's not a, a, a man of the Fianna that didn't have a, a sweetheart at the two of the Donnan, 
Oh, know? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they were, I mean, they were with each other. Like, they, yeah. they were, you know, maybe they were just a different wave of Celts. Who knew? Who knows? Yeah. Um, but they were supposed to be a small, dark people. So maybe not. I think they were North Africans. I think that's where they get the Shenos from. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And the wiliness. <laughs> We're actually Africans. <laughs> Pasty Africans. Well, the old, the old fairies are. Yeah. Um, well, there's a bit of that in us. Yeah. I mean, I think that's... Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I have much more to add to that. Yeah, I think that's a good story. Yeah. Um, so, was, uh, if we can sum it up, what is the story of Finn McCool and the salmon and knowledge about Will I read it again? We'll read oh, it again and we'll give an yeah. overall summary. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Finn went to learn poetry from Finnegus, a poet that lived that was living at the Boyne. For the poets thought it was always in the brink of water poetry was revealed to them. And he did not give him his own name, but he took the name of Dimna. Seven years now, Finnegus had stopped at the Boyne, watching the salmon. For it was in the prophecy that he would eat the salmon of knowledge that would come there, and that he would have all the knowledge ever after. And when at last the salmon of knowledge came, he brought it to where Finn was, and bade, it to ro- bade him to roast it, but he bade him not to eat any of it. And when Finn brought him the salmon, after a while he said, Did you eat any of it at all, boy? I did not, said Finn, but I burnt my thumb putting down the blister that rose in the skin, and after doing that I put my thumb in my mouth. What is your name, boy? Finnegus said. Demna, he said. It is not, but it is Finn your name is, and it is to you and not to myself the salmon was given in the prophecy. With that, he gave Finn the whole of the salmon, and from that time Finn had the knowledge that came from the nuts of the nine hazels of wisdom that grow beside the well that is below the sea. Hmm. Okay. So if we're going to give an overview summary of that, I guess, what is the story about? It's the story... It's a connection for me. It's a connection with the the deeper intuition because consciousness isn't really where deep wisdom and knowledge comes from. If we're talking about knowledge of intuition and following your heart and really having a deep connection to that. The, the sense of the salmon, the thing that comes from the ocean, the depth of the unconscious and forming a connection with that and being able to tap into the wisdom of the deeper unconscious, of that collective unconscious of the boundlessness of your being. Mm. That's what it seems to me, is, it, is it's him forming that connection to the Great Mother, like that that thing of mimicking the nipple, of like going in and tapping in and, and seeing that. Mm. For me, it's that visionary thing that comes with like almost, like the, the, the wisdom of dreams kind of thing, that like, that psychotic state of dreaming and, and visions. Mm. And uh, I feel like it's him forming a connection with that, which enables him to tap into that wisdom throughout his life and yeah and that's the lesson of becoming the the, the filioct the part part magic part poet part mm. um, part druid or part breton lawgiver because those laws are also coming from the unconscious so i like about the fianna they they had a high value of a good education mm. it was like 12 books of poetry they had to learn off by heart All right. um before they were allowed in and um, a lot of other feats as well physical feats and everything like that but but wisdom and intelligence was highly prized among the Fianna it wasn't you weren't brutes just wouldn't get in you know mm. they were uh, they were sophisticated and they were educated and they were they were, uh, they were wise guys that's interesting yeah. yeah so it's a connection not just to to knowledge of power it's it's wisdom of something deeper and again it's the, yeah. the marriage of the the conscious wisdom of the hazel trees and the the depth the refinement of the salmon which by an amazing feat of nature can find its way back to exactly where it came from it goes all the way upstream and it goes against the grain that is natural to water and to everything else it's yeah. almost like a, a a defiance of nature in some way things normally go down you normally repress memories down but for mm. stuff to come up mm. that's uh that's like true wisdom so yeah. i feel like it's that connection of the wisdom of the unconscious with the wisdom of consciousness and that's where the that connection, and like what you're saying, the fee a prizing education and knowledge and wisdom. That's that meeting of having the knowledge to bring people to water, and at that point having the patience to learn, and the salmon of knowledge coming after seven years of waiting. 
So I think that that, mm. that interesting thing, because that's a great thing for a leader to have. And I think that's definitely what I'm seeking with dreams is that wisdom to know how to proceed in life, not just going by my logical consciousness that's conditioned by a society that's out of whack with its instincts, but to tap into the deeper constant mm. the the greater wisdom of the of the entire psyche timeless wisdom yeah yeah, so yeah. Trying to wisdom, wisdom is like the mechanism and through through which you gain knowledge too you know mm. wisdom is like it's uh yeah it's something that is almost you don't choose it's kind of chosen upon you mm. isn't it yeah. like you get that water in you somehow you know, yeah, and it's it's integrated. It's, it's integrated. it's an integration. It's huh? we're, we're like ninety seven percent water or something, and we're yeah. also like ninety seven percent unconscious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and on that note, shall yeah. we? Uh, shall we wrap it up? We shall. We shall. I felt like there was one more thing I was gonna say. I suppose yeah, my summary of the story yeah. would be would be it's a transformative. It's very transformative. Mm. He went to get an education, and what he found during his education destroyed the need for an education it's like it, I just was it gave him yeah. the mechanism to mm. give himself an education you know um, yeah so that's, 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 that's the, an interesting yeah because yeah. you if you think just one more like aside is that like you think of education and especially now in this time mm. that we're re-questioning our premises about what education is yeah. because now it's, it's like well all that knowledge is on Wikipedia mm. so why are we memorising it and not not that I necessarily side with all oh, yeah just but I think that the wisdom is to teach people how to learn. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you can bring you can bring the horse to water, but the, the it's it's teaching the horse to drink. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that whenever he finds water, I think actually probably a better one is you can teach a man to fish. You mm. can give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. You can teach a man to fish and then if he'll. <laughs> that's a good eat for his whole life yeah. that's kind of the perfect yeah, well, that's and, the and perfect. it ties in with everything right? <laughs> yeah, that's excellent, so yeah. it's that thing of it's he learned how to fish he learned how to than, feed himself yeah and yeah. that's rather than just learning the wisdom from Finnegas well yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting it you're getting took it. to the end of the podcast <laughs> but I got it uh, yeah. Yeah, but that's this. all you got from it <laughs> that's really good uh, yeah yeah it's the transformation isn't it it's, it's the boy becoming the man or at least the boy not needing the man anymore yeah. like he's on his way to being a man yeah. and before he can take up arms and become the leader of the Fianna mm. he has to get wise yeah you know that's cool yeah I like that that's and a good place, that note. good place to end yeah so that is the end of another podcast uh, I guess is this podcast number well, it's two. I know at the start of the, the last podcast, we said that was podcast number two, but that's because we did a, a trial run and that trial run wasn't publishable. Is <laughs> that was, the last one? Remember the first one we did? I can't even remember what we were talking remember about. Remember we did the test one and Dave was asking us questions and it was like, uh, oh, yeah. it was all right. So this is... You must watch that back. This, yeah, yeah. So this is really podcast two. Yeah. And yeah, so film it cool. And do we know what we're talking about the next time? We don't, but we'll sit down and we'll, we'll we work that out. We'll, we'll surely have something brilliant for you. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed it. And please subscribe and give us good ratings and all the other things you gotta do. Hit that do. thumbs up, hit, hit that, that notification yeah. bell. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck do I need a notification for? I'll just go on and see if we have something new. Yeah, don't don't yeah. bother hitting the notification bell, don't. No, dude. Yeah, I do, yeah. Do it. Make an exception. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Bye.